Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Bart? Here. Daryl? Here. TJ? Here. Pam? Here. Bruce and I am here. Robert Rizzo is not. He then, might make it. He okay. might not. He's on the other side of his side. He, he's making his way. He's and doing his best. You. Oh, yes. Here. Here. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Of the agenda. Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor of approving the agenda as submitted, say aye. 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 Opposed? None. <clears throat> Public comment. Aye. I would like to thank Bruce for putting out the goodies out there. <laughs> New business items? None. Old business items? Master plan density discussion. How would you like to? All right, so this is kind of a new item, um, but it falls under the category of master planning, so that's where we put it. Um, there has been a bit of discussion in the past months about. Um, potential build out of densities in the township and looking at some different uh, building techniques that folks may be using, especially in some of our agricultural lands. Um, so uh, I was asked to put together a density study and basically what we did was we um, looked at township and we took the zoning districts as they exist, we looked into the zoning ordinance and looked at the densities uh, by which you could build within those districts. Um, essentially took the total acreage of each of those districts um, and then, you know, to use an example, I think in my memo I use uh, agricultural residential as, a, as the example. Um, it's by and large the, the biggest uh, amount of land that we have in the township. So that allows for a uh, minimum of two acre lot per dwelling unit. Um, so we took uh, total acreage divided by two, um, and then added a uh, multiplier, and usually when I'm looking at new development proposals, if you have a raw piece of land, 20% uh, is usually a good number to use for roads, stormwater, that, that kind of thing. So if somebody's coming in and doing a development for which they are required to put in all of that, whether it's a, a private road that does require you know, the roadway easement as well as stormwater, or something like a, a larger subdivision, 20% usually gets you about to that number. Uh, then I worked with the assessor to get um, the number of existing units in the township uh, for each of those districts and uh, subtracted that then from the total. Um, so what you have in front of you is a map that basically looks like our zoning map. <coughs> in the legend, um, we've got potential units and existing units. Um, and so that would be those potential units would be at build out if every uh, acreage in the township was, was built based on these different districts as they exist. Um, now that does not take into account the fact that uh, some of the existing lots are larger than two acres. Um, it doesn't take into account the fact that there are quite a bit of wetlands that would be uh, probably a more involved study to, to get that deep into it. So what I really wanted to do was present you with kind of a, a rough rough number, um, an estimate, if you will, of what the potentiality would be in terms of total build-out units. Um, so I think this gives you at least a good view from uh, a comprehensive planning viewpoint uh, and from a um, policy
policy making standpoint to, to look at what's, what's possible here and think about how we want to deal with that. Um, now, one of the things that I, I've heard many times is that you know we feel that uh, um, the perkability of the land. Am I not talking about it? Oh, does that work now? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know there was. A, I thought it was always on. <laughs> In the past, I couldn't turn it off. Um, so we have, I, I've heard that, you know, folks bank on the fact that, uh, you know, since we don't have utilities in the township, that these areas where we're not extending utilities are going to be somewhat self-regulating from a density standpoint uh, because it's hard to find perks. And so you may have uh, a 10 acre lot, but that doesn't mean that you're going to be able to get eight units on that uh, because, you could maybe only find three or four spots that might might uh, burn well enough to provide an on-site septic system. So what we're dealing with now, and what we've heard from a few people recently, is interest in doing these package treatment plants, which are permitted by the state, and under certain volume are permitted and regulated then by the county. Uh, so if they're under 76,000 gallons a day, uh, they can go to the county and get a permit for something. And so with that technology and with some of the options that we have in our zoning ordinance, like the PUD where you might be able to cluster or something like that, um, that um, thought that we could bank on the, the limited um, uh, capacity of the soil is really kind of false. Um, so I guess what I'm suggesting is uh, if you're looking at these numbers and this looks like something more than, than what we want in terms of density for the township from a policy standpoint, uh, it may be time to think about some other stronger language to put in the ordinance or other tools, strategies that we might recommend in the master plan uh, for you know an ordinance tool to start to deal with it, this in another way. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. That was, that was the task that I was uh, um, given. So these are, these are the numbers that we came up with, and so I, I'm presenting those to you to hear your reactions and just kind of initiate a discussion, so. so once again, quickly, the numbers on the right-hand column there? The numbers on the right-hand column are existing units. So that's the total number of units that you have in each of those districts today. What, what are the districts? I guess I'm looking for the row definition, not the column. The 5250 and the 1300, what, they are under what? Agricultural. Well, that lines up with agricultural? Well, I guess it doesn't really line up, does okay. it? That's I'm, I'm picking up what you're laying down. Yeah. So each of those lines up with? It should line up with the top. Okay. I'm there now. Thank you. Yeah. So, right. manufactured housing does not? You know, we didn't put the manufactured housing in because there is a park, and it kind of is what it is. And it's not, okay. It's not All right, so it stops after him or something. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. You know, relative to the Shostead development in this, is this new legislation that, uh, as far as putting in treatment plants and things of that nature, or it's not new. It's yeah. been it's been around for um, I think 2008 ish is, okay. is when they uh, when the state passed this legislation that permitted the package treatment plants. Oops. I know the first time that I came to. The planning commission meeting was the builder off of North Territory on Baffertson Road wanted to put in a treatment plant, mm -hmm. build a bunch of homes and put in a waste treatment plant. And we were downwind of all of that. And my neighbors and I came to the meeting and raised hell about it and everything. <laughs> and uh, subsequently, he was denied. But where does where does Shostek stand on that? Could they could they try to exercise that option, being that there's so much controversy over? Putting in water and sewers? No, so we have an, an ordinance for the utility service district saying that you shall bring in utilities to that area. So that that is an ordinance that regulates that area. And they can't they can't override that or anything. Correct. Okay. Okay. Because I can I could just foresee them looking to take that path, you know, because it's less expense for them. Well, Unless they turn a responsibility. If they're so nice, they'll turn the responsibility over to the township to maintain it. Well, that's one of the things that we want to avoid, certainly. And um, the way the legislation is written is that there has to be somebody, ultimately, to um, be responsible. And so initially, um, it would fall on the homeowners association once the developer turns it over to homeowners. 
but at the end of the day, if that ever <coughs> fails and, and they're not able to pay for it, they're not able to deal with it, then it falls back on the township. Yeah, I know that when we came in to protest it several years ago, it, they, their proposal was the township would take responsibility of the waste treatment plan. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the township necessarily wants that responsibility. Obviously, the no, township maintains the treatment plant for the hamlet, and it's not a lot of fun. No dealing with these things. I mean, um, you know, so that's, that's some of the consideration that I put forth in this memo that I hope to get the chance to read. So you, but, okay, so forget Shostak, mm -hmm. the rest of the township. Do we have protection against those waste treatment plants if a builder buys a big piece of land and decides they want to put in a development and put those in? Well, I, I believe that um, the, the legislation that's in place right now. That would take precedent? Yes, yeah. so so some communities have passed uh, wastewater treatment ordinances so that they have more stringent requirements for the development of such a wastewater treatment plant. Um, I don't believe that you can outright prohibit them, um, but you can certainly create your own local ordinance that is uh, has stronger regulations. How many, 76,000 gallons per day? How many houses, do you have any idea of how many houses that services? 35. 35. I believe so. Do you think that's higher or less? So that being said, though, a lot of these 80 acre farms could very easily fall into that requirement that, you know, be able to put in that package treatment and, and still do the 30 houses or whatever it is, 25, 30 houses in there, which is predominantly, I mean, one of the places I live is an 80 acre farm that was chopped up into small lots and that's the way it is and that's what happens a lot um, I think in in our township. Yep. So that is a, a viable means of stamping out a lot of small developments. It may be cost prohibitive. You don't know what that's gonna be. No, I don't know what the cost is. But yeah, I mean so each obviously each deal, if you will, is different and the developer would have to look at what the cost of land is, what the cost of doing the development is, and what the cost of putting that plant in would be. But um, the cost the cost of land is a factor too, because I know the builder that built my house stopped building in Salem because he said the property, the land was too expensive. Mm -hmm. You can build in other areas a lot cheaper. Well, we don't have any control over that necessarily. I'm just saying it's it, it is a, mm -hmm. it is a factor as a deterrent as long as the property values remain the way. Couple um, questions. So, so the math, back to the math. Um, potential units are in addition to the existing, or oh, that's the total potential minus the existing. No. So we we got a total potential number, subtracted out the existing units, and came up with that. Number. So these are the potential new. Yes. Potential additional. Additional. Okay. And then uh, uh, back to the, uh, the the package treatment. I imagine the soil somewhere within the parcel has to be well enough well enough to, to handle that or is this something completely I'm not familiar enough with it to know is this something that I can get engineered into even the worst soil conditions uh, my understanding is that you do have to have a pretty solid pocket of sand um, so it just allows you to utilize that because it, it has has in a couple places in our township or not that package deal where they had a nice pocket of sand and they, they literally parceled out pathways for each Lot to reach that, that yes. brick site. I know the spot you're talking about. It's one of the one of the weirdest looking divisions I've seen. <laughs> yes. So, um, so I, I just to keep things in perspective, I did a little homework though. Um, uh, so that would bring our total up to 68. You know, say seven and two is under 9,000 total living units, and Canton's got currently 33,500 and the same number of acres or whatever you want to call it north hills the north hill township in, in the city plus plymouth township in the city has twenty eight thousand units so we're we're looking at you know a third to a quarter of the two couple of surrounding um, wayne county communities but that being said you said we should look at adopting an ordinance that potentially at least like you said, you can't say no, but you can put it as tight as possible so that 
at least it limits our burden should we actually get one um, come into our township that if not limits our burden or reduces the number of them that potentially could meet that requirement yeah so that's financially at least one suggestion and, and I guess um, you know I have a list of, of items that may be mm -hmm. potential ideas um, I guess I'd encourage you all to kind of discuss this these numbers amongst yourselves to talk about you know just like you say with the, with the total here it's still well less than some of our neighbors if this were ever to build out were ever to be realized um, my impression from the work that I've done here and working with you all is that the intent of the township is to stay as low development low volume as possible um, so that's it's kind of why I bring up these ideas because I speculate that in your discussion that's the direction I'm going to hear out of well again that being said I I'm hearing the same thing and I'm, I'm agreeing with it but at the same point allowing people the opportunity to develop their land as as they would like to or see that they feel like they should be able to we just want to have our master plan written so that they they see what our, our focus is and that we're again if we're going to end up with something like that that it meets a, a stringent requirement or that we don't infringe on which we one of your strategies talk about you know parsing out wetlands and in in the math just parsing out wetlands and water recharge areas and woodland areas which kind of we do already but at least it spells it out more clear if you put it in the master plan and in ordinances uh, in overlays map overlays to support all that so that's clear so I, I think just adding clarity is not a bad thing if we could just add the clarity through the ordinances and the overlay maps and things like that would be would be helpful to the strategies that are probably already mapped out in your, your memo here as well as already existing friend of mine was a builder and he built some homes in Superior Township and two of the houses he built were across the street from one another and he had a septic field and all at one person's house and then ran the stuff from the other house across the street into that field that wasn't in Washington County was it yeah I don't think they would allow for that today <laughs> wasn't that long ago <laughs> can't share systems can't share systems no. what about water no, I think they want every, every parcel to have their own. Now, and these developments with this uh, waste treatment facility, uh, if they're trying to consolidate that way, you know, to help people with where the soil is perkable, what about well? Why wouldn't they go to a community well? So usually it's pretty easy to find individual wells um, in these kind of developments, these smaller scale developments. Uh, I have been involved in a project where they're trying to do a community well for, um, I'm going to say it's 250 homes. Um, I think that's been one of the biggest issues with them getting off the ground is because they did some test drilling. And as soon as they started doing a drawdown, they started drawing down some neighboring well systems so that you know, caused cause some problems. So, I mean, you, you've got to be able to find pretty substantial aquifer to mm -hmm. facilitate, depending on the size of, of the unit or, or number of units you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like we can't prohibit um, and that the, the HOA is responsible, but then if the HOA can't take care of it for whatever reason, then we do become responsible. So there's really no way for the township to get out of the responsibility if one of these systems fail. So ideally, um, as, as we have dealt with these things and learned over the years, we've put a pretty ironclad um, development agreement and maintenance agreement in place. Um, so that when this thing gets turned over from the developer to the homeowners association there's a clear understanding of what their responsibility is how much money they have to contribute annually in order to maintain the system and there are required testing that has to happen weekly um, and reports that go to the county 
constantly so the county monitors at each place it's not like a, it's not like the president of the homeowners association is the one doing it you know like maybe you know sometimes you'll you'll see those people getting tasked with you know whatever the lawn care is or something like that but something like this is, is a very uh, serious endeavor and so usually there's a, a management company that works for them however through mismanagement through lack of funds the fallback at the end of the day is always the local municipality. I think if the economy does one of these you could potentially get more and more and be tasked with saddled with more responsibility. Just Look at it worst case scenario. Right. Just a dovetail on that though, what we're gonna end up with is managing around okay, so there is a home in foreclosure or whatever in, in that. So now we've got to manage around that or issues. So we're gonna get dragged into homeowner issues as on my street right now, we have somebody not paying their maintenance, and you don't really have an association, it's just that maintenance fee, and someone's not paying it. So what's gonna happen? You know, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we're not calling the township, but that's what the typical response is gonna be, drag the township in to try and settle the problem. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's gonna become maybe uh, a burden to us, not necessarily owning the, the, the problem, but and every if there's enough of them, there's going to be those phone calls. And mm -hmm. This one didn't do that. Somebody did this. Right. Someone's not paying. The bank owns the house. And whatever. So. Paul, is it is it very prevalent these on-site treatment facilities for a project? Is that in Washtenaw County? Say, is it? Um, there are a handful of them. Um, the ones that I'm aware of. Been, some of them have been problematic. That's not, I, that was going to be my next question. Um, but, you know, one that I'm thinking of in particular was problematic to start out with, and now the community seems to have a handle on it. Um, I'm, I'm aware of uh, development that was to be built in two phases. Um, I believe it was in Ann Arbor Township recently. They built the first phase with the package treatment plant and the developer ended up going without it in the second phase because the whole thing was such a, so arduous for them. So. On, on, on your recommendations, I'm wondering if you can kind of go through some of those and, and maybe give us some examples of what you were referring to. Um, okay. Like strengthening of the PUD eligibility criteria. So I'm sure based on my direction, my memo, you all went and looked at the eligibility criteria before the meeting today, right? Uh, I have a copy of it right here. <laughs> um, let me flip to that section real quickly. I'm sorry. <laughs> Please open your zoning ordinance and just Uh, so, right here in section 50.301, you have eligibility criteria, and so it lists off uh, six different uh, criteria, and then uh, seven has a number of sub-criteria or additional criteria. Um, so, some of these are somewhat subjective. Um, Compatibility with the master plan, for example, the proposed development shall be compatible with adopted master plan and consistent with the plan character of the proposed development area as expressed in the master plan. So that's one area where I think that we could put more language into the master plan to give you all, as decision makers, um, kind of a, a better um, or a clearer understanding of, of what that is. That also then gives developers a clearer understanding of what they're up against when you guys have to or ask to make this kind of decision. Um, so, and then, you know, like I think one of the other criteria that jumps out at me is um, conservation of open space. Um, so a lot of folks will come in and say, well, we're conserving all this open space, but is that open space that, you know, is going to be usable at the end of the day, or is it just open space around the houses? Um, is it productive? You know, is it um, high, high quality natural resources? Is it 
are there items that you're, you're really looking to um, protect, or are they just checking a box by saying, okay, well, we've got 50% of our spot is not built on, it's not including homes. Um, so some of those things, I think, can probably we could strengthen the language if you, feel, if you feel it's necessary. I mean, you may look at all these things and say, well, I could look at that and be able to kind of apply that to any particular development that comes to us. Um, it would be nice if we had two developments going, say we got the show step one where it's heavily wooded in certain areas, and then you had one where it was just a previous farm they're developing it, and then you have that open space that you see what, you know, where you could be planted or something, you know what I'm saying? Uh, there probably should, should be some language where they have to plant and develop that open space so it's not just plain open space. If you have a PUD you know, agreement, uh, we, we have language on tree mitigation, but what about the absence of trees and putting trees in? We do tell people to put trees in on certain projects that come for approval. We talk about, you know, landscaping and everything. And I'm just wondering, like you mentioned that open space, what, what good is the open space if you put a PUD development in and you got this open land? You, should we have some kind of language that says, well, maybe this land, certain things should be done to this open land? I think I'm following you. So in other words, um, if you have a, say, 100 acre piece of land, mm -hmm. and it's an ag, ag district, so you, you know, think you could get 40, 45 houses in there. Mm -hmm. um, and the site is basically devoid of, um, any kind of natural features or anything because it's been farmed or what have you. Uh, and so they plunk their development right down in the middle of it or on the front half of it. Mm -hmm. And then they, they leave the portion surrounding that as, as open space, but it's just unusable kind of. Under the PUD thing, because it's the aggregate of all the property. In other words, you might you know, cluster homes mm -hmm. because you've got other land that, that's included in that project. You know, and I'm saying that the other land is wide open, nothing on it. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, and because that doesn't do anything really to, to curb sprawl, if you will, because you're still taking up the same 100 acres, but is that open space connected to other open space, or is it? Yeah, you'd hate to see just a bunch of weeds growing up. You know, right? Well, I mean, we have requirements. <laughs> you, know, you have to put in a 50-foot landscape buffer around PUD. Yeah, I can see that. Um, but so, okay, that's, that's an interesting But the open point. land could be an ISAR. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've heard that in one of our meetings yet. <laughs> Linda? Yeah, I'm probably the only person in the room who owns 100 acres. So maybe I can speak with some knowledge. First of all, if the farmer's going to develop his land, there's a huge reason to do a pod and they keep 50 acres open. There's less cost to put in the infrastructure. Sure. You, know, you have to put in the road, the utilities don't go as far. There's a huge cost savings to whoever develops it. When you have vacant land, and again, if we had any people in agriculture on this body, somebody would understand it firsthand. Land, it starts to grow things. There's certain seed built into the ground. So yeah, you're going to get some tall grasses, typically, where the weeds that grow in the field. But eventually, you'll start to get trees. And a lot of, if you just leave a field and you, you don't cultivate it, it will grow trees eventually. Yes, seeds it come, will. birds carry quickly. Birds <laughs> carry seeds, they drop seeds. Yeah. There are plants that are opportunists. They will go in before the grasses, before the other things come. Once your grasses, you get wildflowers once they take over those plants with you. To, to, to say you want to have a planting and that there's no benefit. It's just wrong. Fifteen years uh, again, ago. Again, so, somehow why you questions. would have the, the open space might be as that neighborhood, maybe they want to have a combined area for horses. It's depend on another community. So they, they have a communal barn. They handle how they pay and appreciate the comments groups made about getting people to pay their fair share. But then they have trails through meadows you may have wooded areas. I would encourage this township not to be too restrictive about what it is. If you want to preserve land, that is a way to preserve open space. 
if you start, I will tell you right now, if you start to see you got to plant tree, these trees, when the library was built, the original library, so this is 23 years ago, $500 a tree, or a tree of three inch caliper, and they were maple and some old. You're not going to have a developer see a cost savings if you start to do that type of thing. The other thing is you guys are talking about um, your on-site septics and you're concerned about the township being involved. Anytime somebody doesn't like something, the township's involved. All you got to do is come to the township board meeting, somebody doesn't like cable, and they come every meeting to discuss what they don't like about cable. Or they don't like another neighbor, and they'll be here because Unfortunately, the Planning Commission and the Township Board are those bodies who will still hear and listen to you and might actually care, which is so rare today. So if you're trying to eliminate that, I don't think it's possible. Thank you. Um, you know, when you're talking about the open space, I, I, I don't, I guess I don't understand or maybe agree with, you know, trying to make it into something but I, I, I do agree with at least taking a look at it and say, does it make sense that, you know, it's either clustered here or clustered there or taking in account natural resources. I don't mind open fields, but <laughs> to see them. Well, you know, I guess, but, I guess but, what Linda's saying would probably be. It's discussion here too. I mean, that's why, that's why this is on the agenda is to discuss it. It would be probably up to the homeowners what they want to do with it. And if they wanted to put some paths in, or like you say, if they want to raise horses or whatever they want to do with it. And what you're saying about the growing, I own some property that <laughs> the trees grew up on it so fast, I could not believe it, <laughs> you know. From one time visiting it to the next time, it is like a forest, you know. Actually, so. Dan, if you look at the species of trees coming in over time, as, as you start to get what's called the more mature woods, the species change. Mm -hmm. So I, I would, again, with all due respect, I would kind of limit what you want. But the other thing that you possibly could have with a PUD is you could have where a farmer still farms it for you. Yeah, I thought it was, yeah. And then, you know, how do I put it in my corn or my soybean or whatever if you're telling me I've got to have you know, something like a landscape? Well, look at these PUDs and these you know, preserved areas or something. That doesn't. If it is a concern, it doesn't take care of the concern of population. No. You know, okay. No. Average population is still the same. The population growth is still the same. Is it? I mean, is is that a legit concern? I think this is a great conversation. It's great that this came up. Um, but I mean, the, it, I it does to the, the ex think, it does to the extent of the number of units per acreage. Okay, so if in a few. But can be different, yes. can it? As far as how many homes on a certain number of acres, it could it could be there could there be a requirement that you have to have more land per unit or less land per unit, or how does that work? Because what that it? affects population. Yeah, from what I understand, we we weren't talking about that ratio that way. If it was forty five homes to hundred acres. Does it matter to the person that's concerned with population? Whether those 45 homes are spread evenly or they're all jammed up in one corner. But as far that, as roads and traffic and population is concerned, it's no different. Yeah, and unless and there's the a question. different. There's so, you know, I guess what I'm saying is here is let's make sure we're going after what we think we want to go after, if indeed we even want to go after it. Well, and I, and I think that's the question that, yeah. that we're asking is, is what is the goal? You know, so if, it's, there you go. if it is to, to maintain a smaller population. If, if we recognize that you know some of these tools are in place that allow for that, um, I, I think that my point was some of these these tools that are in place. We want to make sure that they're doing what we want them to do. If, if our goal is to limit yeah, the population, in that case, the best way to do it is just meet it head on. We're looking for. You know, don't try and make something that you know has some sort of Venn diagram where it takes a little chunk out of it or something. No, just meet it head on and say this is it. But I, I'm not sure how that. I would not be the one to sit there and say, oh, we're going to put a 15-acre uh, minimum on any piece of property from here on out. I, I think we can, you know, I mean, that would certainly, some, some, you know, there, that, that, varies by, by, that varies by township, too, where the number of acres you have to have per lot size. Mm -hmm. I, I know of some that require five acres. But... Um, 
what I, you know, I think what I was trying to get at on that, uh, trying to put this succinctly, uh, if they put in pod units, what is the property requirement because of clustering? They're saving a lot of money with infrastructure by clustering. So they are, they, their, their thing is to say, well, we give you, we'll give you the land, so much, so many units per acre. Okay. I think that, but is there a formula for that? That's what I was trying to ask. Well, the, the formula is that they have to, they still meet the uh, base density. Okay. When, okay. So if it's a two acre thing, and they cluster, two, two acre minimum requirement, and they cluster, then the total units have to equal two acres per unit total. Okay. And that's, so it goes according to the way it's zoned. Okay. Um, I, w I was going to say that. Oh, that's loud. Sorry. Sorry. Um, what are what are when they talk about like dual plans? You know, having to submit like dual plans because. Okay, so say they could if you broke everything up into two acre uh, parcels and you could put thirty five homes on it. Now we're going to cluster thirty five homes. I'm not against anybody developer saving any money or doing whatever, but what I think we should be looking at is the character of the community. Um, but still, in, in the report, and I think what a lot of us have always banked on, is not all two acres are perkable. And I think a lot of us who've, who have been in the community always kind of bank on that, is that will save us. You, you can't develop all that. So now these guys are kind of getting around that in what we were using as a it's kind of like a little bit of a safety net to keep our population down. It doesn't apply anymore. The property that I live on today, the previous owner that, said, said they could not find any any approvals. I found three. So I guess I'm asking how that yeah. works. So a, a dual plan, what, what some, some ordinances require is that um, in your application for something like a planning development or cluster development, you would put forth a plan if you were to build it based on uh, standard, um, a standard subdivision. So if you just came in under the under the uh, zoning district, what would you be able to build? So you would put together a pretty basic plan. It wouldn't be super detailed engineering, but detailed enough to show where the roads were, where the stormwater is, where you're doing your land balancing so that you could come up with, like you say, kind of the density that you'd be able to build under normal zoning. Does and so, that include like being a the perkability and all that? Well, not necessarily. I mean, I, I don't guess, see how could they would, they wouldn't possibly go and spend the money to test for that. That's no, crazy. Right, that would be crazy. Um, so no, typically I haven't seen that. Um, but you know, we were talking about the goal, the goal that I've heard, Quite a few meetings here is maintaining the rural atmosphere mm -hmm. in the town. It's the it's the rural thing. I don't. I heard that more than I heard population or anything else was. You know. Okay. So um, this the dual plan is based on standard subdivision, and then they bring in their thing. A few months ago, we had a probably a year ago. There was like that population study, number of families, you know, what was it going to, what were the predictions it was going to be in 10 years, another in 20 years, and like everything around us was increasing by pretty large factors, and I think ours was like, uh, I think ours was going to go down by 20 families. Yeah. Could, could we see what that was based on? So those are uh, some semcog projections. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, it would just be interesting to kind of see what, what, what factors or variables they brought in to predict that. Because, I mean, this, obviously this is something that may have lesser of a chance than happening, but nonetheless it is a potential outcome. Well, this is, this is a potential outcome, and, and it could happen, you know, in 20 years or 50 years or 100 years if the entire township was built out, right? So mm -hmm. the, the SEMCOG projections are based on you know, economic growth and, and attraction to an area, and some of that's a little... The economic practice. factor, though, yeah. is a big piece of that equation. Yeah. I, I don't like uh, using projections in master planning 
very well because those things can ebb and flow depending on what the economy is done. And you, you can see where the um, some of those projections that were done prior to the 2008 crash kind of just got thrown out the window. That's what I was getting mm -hmm. at. I would, I would imagine that. that, that I mean, really when it comes down to it, between Salem and Northfield and Superior and Northern Ann Arbor and everything down there, I mean, this area is going to become much more popular than it is right now. There's actually people in South Lyon that know where Salem is now. They actually know where it is. I'm mm -hmm. very impressed with that. Um, I'd, I'd be interested in seeing what, you know, because we all fall under Washington, I'd be interested in seeing what Northfield and Superior would think about it, or if they're already thinking about this. Be interesting. Linda. You guys are referencing other communities. And when you look at, first of all, North Hill and Plymouth are not 36 square mile townships. They're small. So they have you know, more people on a smaller, smaller area. Canton didn't develop because it had two different minimums. Can't develop because they had sewer. And that's the big thing here. Mm -hmm. I'm not against you talking about whether we can have on site sewage treatment facilities or not. But the reality is, we're going to have over in the USD extremely dense development for Salem Township. Why? Because it's on a sewer. Not because it's on a two acre minimum, not because in a hundred years all these parcels can't be developed. And I think that that's, that's the thing, piece that we're missing realistically. If you look at the map, and somebody did a real simple math, here's how many acres are in AR. They did some type of uh, calculation because you actually can't build on two acres, minimum of 2.26 acres by the time you take out your frontage for road, which... Yeah, he added a 20%. He added a 20%. Yeah. You know, so we, we, we fixed take. that a little bit. But when you look at this map, you start to see, yes, there are some areas where you could potentially developers might come in and do some things, but there's a lot of areas they're not going to because you guys have already said the cost would be. So to say that we're, we could potentially have 5,000 units, well, we could potentially have 10 if we have sewers. If we can't contain sewers in the USD, there's all sorts of things that could happen. And that's what happened in Portland and in Northville and in Canton. It's not about the zoning on a map like this. It wasn't what was in their master plan because Canton had a line of demarcation. Sewers weren't going to come this side, on the west side of there. Canton Center Road. Nothing west come. of Canton. That's yeah. right. And, and all of a sudden, somebody got the brilliant idea for Cherry Hill Village, mm -hmm. and they took off. And, and that's the biggest thing is not doing what you're doing now. But it's, it's, and that's what Superior Township has done that we have not. You look at these sections here, and you have almost no section without residential homes, even the ones that are still owned by some of us large landowners. Pieces that have been cut off or something. You go into Superior Township, <coughs> their sections that are agriculture, that's what they are. And they said, we're going to, they have their on, um, Gettys, the other side of Gettys, where they have water and sewer. And I think that's where your strategy needs to be. And that's where the, what it's predicated on here in the township, that we want that development around the USD. And I think that that's where you have to strengthen it, and that's what you have to be so clear about. Multi-family, all that stuff, it goes over where there's public water and sewer. This stuff, 100 years? It, it, it's not viable for us to sit in a room tonight and figure out what this looks like in 100 years. In 1976, I went to my great-grandfather's funeral. He was 102. He was born two years before electric lights, and he lived to see man walk on the moon. And guaranteed, you, guaranteed that when he was a young man, he didn't dream. He worked for Ford Motor Company. He was their oldest living retiree when he died. He didn't see the automobiles that we ride in today. He wouldn't understand what any of these devices that we have in front of us are because things change. And so be realistic with what you're doing. This is not a 100-year plan tonight. It should be maybe a 5 or 10. 
maybe a little bit longer. But I just, I'd like to see you guys, you guys have done a great job of being realistic, understanding the property owner's rights. Kind of stay on that track, don't get too far off. Because again, what Canton and Northville and Point have all failed to do is hold that line. And that's why we're discussing what some of the tightening up are tightening up would be because my next question is um, update the regulations to the zoning ordinance to protect the natural features i think we've always kind of thought they were good but what what other suggestions just examples of what would be better so um it's kind of better understand what we're talking yeah about. and and bruce bruce indicated this uh, briefly a moment ago um, <laughs> Essentially, uh, we recognize the importance of protecting uh, some of our natural features um, in terms of the ability to build with a certain density on a particular lot. There is the possibility to say, um, you know, to define your net lot area as the area of less certain features. So I think wetlands is one that I've certainly seen. So if you've got a, a 10 acre parcel, but half of it is wetlands, you technically only have a five acre parcel. Um, and so, you know, we do require you to get a wetland permit if you're gonna do any work on a wetland, but to look at that lot and say, okay, we have an average density of being able to build five homes on this lot because it's 10 acres. If we define the, the net lot area differently, um, that would change the, the net density of you will. So that's an example of something like that. Um, that's that's one that I've seen before. Uh, woodlands, not necessarily. Um, I think the, the woodland regulations um, that we have right now do, to an extent, protect the woodlands. But they, um, you know, usually the way woodland protections help to. To protect those natural features is by stringently requiring mitigation for any trees that you take out, whether it be woodland trees or heritage trees or landmark trees, depending on what you call them. Um, but we have allowances then for anything that would be within a building envelope to uh, be exempt from those uh, mitigation regulations. So, so those are things that, that we might look at that would add strength to protecting some of those natural features. And, and and again, these are just suggestions. I've thrown some ideas on the paper because I want to feel hear from you what your tolerance is or what your desire is to do these kind of things. Um, because what that does then is it, it does make uh, development less uh, favorable or, or less attractive to folks. And so some of these tools are to, to create, um, create an environment where where we clearly uh, delay, uh, clearly um, project a message to, to folks that that's what our, our uh, priorities are in the township. So I threw those kind of things out because I'd like to hear your reaction to them. And you know, to, to be clear, while I did suggest that this number is like a 100 year build out, um, any land within this these districts are subject to these regulations. So we're certainly not thinking that everything's gonna be built out from edge to edge, but you might be able to have the density of a particular subdivision plunked down here or here or no, here. The, so the whole, the whole exercise is just a starting point. Yeah. You know, it's a rough draft starting mm -hmm. point to, to start the conversation. I think the conversation's been very good. I think, you know, the strongest thing in here is Strengthening the PUD, PUD uh, eligibility, you know, those the criteria for PUD eligibility. Right. And to protect and natural falls under, you keep the rural aspect of it in there. Right. Those are considered, you know, would you consider the PUD rural? People wanted to create, um, you know, like a mini Northville or a mini Plymouth in the middle of the field somewhere. You know, I mean, that's not what our master plan is. It's rural master show stick development. Does our master plan protect? If you want property that's not developed involved in a PUD, then you do a show stick development. 
does our master plan protect us from somebody wanting to do that? Do we need that protection? We're just, you know, we're just asking all the questions to get it out there. So, just, I'm sorry, describe what you mean. Somebody wanting to, you know, put a put a like a mini north bill with all the the curves and all this kind of stuff that that's their PUD, you know, their um, 4,500 square foot homes, and just, you know, it's like they take take one of those subdivisions out of Northville and, and put a portion of it in the middle of the field. Is is that what our community wants? Is that acceptable? You know, with one of these treatment plans? Or, that to me that that doesn't that doesn't fit. But are they allowed to do that, or does our master plan protect? And that, how do we how do we make how do we make that because the economy is, is, is moving. How do we ensure that these developers create their developments that look like Salem, so to speak, you know, a little more agricultural? So I, I think that um, we could probably add language to the master plan that describes more precisely the look and feel that we'd like to see with neighborhood homes. Um, so if, if a neighborhood is being built, I think that we could provide additional language and then that would ultimately then translate in, into a strategy would that be to update the zoning ordinance to make these particular requirements or, you know. Okay. Um, but I, I guess I'd like to hear a discussion from everybody else whether or not they'd like to see that or, or whether that's against what we're looking for. Bruce, you keep I'm raising your hand. <laughs> <laughs> to keep adding up, but a couple of things, just on, like you were talking about. You know, I live on a street where there's a little bit of eclecticness to the style of the homes, so it looks, you know, there's some mix of some rural looking homes along with. But I said, I like the street I live on. The street next to me that developed afterwards looks like an, ex you know, stretched out version of a Northville subdivision. Pete, three Pete. Uh, type homes, you know, architecturally. I mean, they're, there's a lot to them, but at the same time, they're, they just, like I said, they look like 14 houses out of, out of Northville plopped in the middle of Salem Township, mm -hmm. and there's there's no variety, enough variety or, or variedness that, that I see in a lot of our developments that we have, not just one of them, but a lot of them have. Um, I don't want to sound too loose, but eclectic, where there's just different styles of architecture. It's not all the same thing. So that I do like, and, and then just in, in comment, I think you said it correctly, is the reason why we're throwing so many things out here, it's an exercise. You, you gotta bounce the stuff off the walls just to make sure that you didn't forget something and let the stuff fall to the floor that doesn't belong. Um, so exercise, I think, is a good thing, but obviously we do want to drop off things that don't, don't seem to work. Um, one of the items that you had on here was, um, which we kind of been, I didn't hear anybody talk about them, but uh, transfer of development rights was one of the strategies. And wasn't, wasn't explained yet, but I kind of know, I think I know what they are. But, um, but you know, overall, I, I tend to agree that if we look at just doing some of the simpler things and just I'd like to see the language just tightened up a little bit so that as something is said in the master plan, word for word, you can see it in the in an ordinance so that there's no dancing around it with people coming to town. So just, just looking at that more grammatically, making sure that things tie out real well. And and maybe just looking at small language changes to maybe the PUD agreement, the on-site subject, uh, and then the one that, uh, because I'm on land preservation, looking at, um, again, not restricting people from doing what they sure could be able to do, but understanding the fact that we are on a well system predominantly, that our water is very important to us, and uh, looking at our, our two uh, uh, river systems that you know we don't overwhelm them as well. So some of our tree areas are not necessarily designated wetlands, but they might be areas where um, they might be the equivalent of a rain garden, if you will, where they're naturally retaining some water so it's, just, so it's not rushing down into the, mm -hmm. the watersheds. But, but most importantly, to protect our wells and our water recharge systems and putting that on, a, on an overlay so it's very clear that these areas are not, even though it's there right now, I can look it up on the Washtenaw website and 
find out what are wetlands and then the U.S. websites and things like that to find them out, but it would be nice if we could actually put it right into, clearly into an ordinance and clearly into a map that reference, that's referenced in the ordinance that's, or references to a map that's able to be looked up, a specific map that's maintained by somebody, whether it be the watersheds or whatever, I don't know who would actually maintain such a map, but, but just so that and that in itself will take care of 90% of what we're looking for. I don't think anybody here is trying to actually restrict, you know, population. That's wrong. You can't write that in there. But, but what we want is back to what everybody said, the rural character and that things all fit. They look like they belong where they're at, not like they're out of place. I just, you know, like the land preservation uh, thing uh, sticks in my head that uh, is it all land that's beautiful land, perks all over the place, and then we're going to leave that clay over there alone for a, a developer to come in, which he knows can't be any good. Why aren't we picking that land also? And then you, you mentioned, several mentioned about the density. Why don't we increase them? Like uh, for uh, development, you can't go less than one acre per house instead of going two per house that they want over there, per acre rather. And keep it that way, control it that way if we can. Uh, I, I don't want it like, but Northfield has five acre minimums. I think we were there at that at one point in time with five acres and went down to two, which is, I think is suitable, really. But then I look at what I live on, I can't build another house on it because I happen to have a, 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 a storm drain that runs through the property and it does fill up in the springtime with water. So I lose that, but I pay for it. You know, uh, I don't know, it's, we got to make it so, uh, like, like Pam says about putting a downtown over here in a, in a farm field. That, that can't be done. That can't pop up uh, with somebody that wants to make a, like a mini, like what, what's the one over there on Cherry Hill, the, that Canton town or whatever it is. Yeah. Okay, now where is Canton, the downtown Canton? Is it that down, is that downtown Canton or where all the stuff is on Canton yeah. Center Road and Ford Road? Is that downtown yeah. Canton? Yeah. Or, uh, it's, you know, I don't know. Do we want that? Would we want that? I, I said, I think. The Hamlet would be great to do something like what they have down there in Cherry Hill. I was thinking the same thing, you, you know. know yeah. Develop this in a fashion that could look like that, or, you know, not exactly, but have things that they have, a, a theater down there for shows and plays and things of that nature, uh, various type of businesses and restaurants and things of that. That to me, you know, if you know, if you have in your head, what, what do you want to see here? You know, you want to see all open space? Geez, there's nothing here. Evidently, nobody does nothing here. You know, it, it just can't all be open. Yeah. Uh, and and the open space that they put in these subdivisions that, that pop up, I don't know if anybody uses them at all. You know, they go through them, but yet you <laughs> put a restriction on them, you got to have so much open space. Yeah, you know, I don't know if that's really I come out of this as I look like I have enough open space. I don't need more. That's for sure to look at because it's there. You know, you go down Curtis Road and there's a lot, a lot of open space there. Uh, but I, I hate to see us uh, wind up like Canton. I mean, once they started building, I mean, they went nuts. And uh, I don't think they can go much further uh, with their boundaries, just about like Plymouth Township did. They're up to their boundary line with uh, development and that. So uh, then they get landlocked, like some of itself is landlocked, as they say. The township has got everything and they have just the downtown from and that's it. And I don't you know, and the nice homes are there, the old style homes are there in Plymouth. Like Northfield, the old styles are in downtown, but outside of it, it's all the modern new stuff. Uh, and forces the people in, in the towns to pay higher taxes because they're landlocked, basically. 
I don't know. Myself, I, I like the community the way it is, but you got to be open for development to come in. You gotta, you gotta have some come in here. You can't restrict it and say, "Hey, we don't want nothing," because I think that's harder to deal with uh, uh, than having uh, uh, the development. Trying to keep it out, I think, is more of a job than to let it come in and and, try, and, and just manage it. That's you get, you've got to manage it. And I guess the the words. In the ordinances, has got to spell it out that in, in the fashion that we can, we do have control uh, in that. That's short term, short term, we're, we're more concerned about, like Bruce said, our water systems and that, you know, our water supply, you know, the aquifers and all that. Linda said, right on target. Water and sewers, forget it. Because Canton had every kind of ordinance, every kind of roadblock and everything for development. You couldn't put up signs. You had to have berms in front of the restaurants and everything. And that all went to hell. The builders just steamrolled it all. Yeah. And so once water and sewer is gone, <laughs> and the builders will, will beat you down. I'll tell you that right now. I saw it happen in Canton. So, so which leads to the question is, you know what? If if we have our USD, do we have limits on how far that infrastructure can go? Yeah, so that's what our USD the, ordinance. Says. Well, the, the, the mm -hmm. sewer capacity and the water is limited to that. That's the capacity, you know, because I think they talked about bringing in the pipe from Yucca, and I think Superior Township was nervous about it because they're thinking that could incur. It. But that pipe can only accommodate that. Uh, you know, uh, show state development, I'm going to call it. Um, oh, that's the capacity, the PD area. The, yeah. that, the, the PD area. area. Yeah, that, I'm blind. I'm kind of, of, when I say show state development, I'm kind of referring to the whole yeah. PD area. They own most of the land up there. But there's no more capacity for it. And, but by the same token, for our township, there's no more capacity to use that system because it's going to be maxed out with the PUD development. Is that correct? I mean, isn't that right? Is well, that I think it comes down to a, a, a policy decision, and, and the policy makers have to continually reaffirm that policy position that this line in the sand remains the line in the sand. Um, because whether you know the system is built for this limited acreage and this number of developments and the tower is only so big, there's always the chance to engineer something differently. At sure, the sure. So you, you as policymakers, the township board, the planning commission, the residents who come to meetings and um, provide their opinions, have, will have to continue to kind of maintain that that policy. But it was intentional not to have the capacity limited. I understand. PUD, because so that it, people don't have the idea of, well, wait a minute, we want to tap tap in two miles down, you know, I mean. Well, they'll keep asking. Oh, they'll keep well, asking. That's, what that's, is the west boundary? What is the west boundary? We know the, uh, the, uh, the north is territorial, the east is Napier and Joy Road. What is the boundary center, to the west? Center line is section 26 and section 35. Oh, well, that's not right in here, though. <laughs> Uh, 26 and 35, is that by well, Casper? Does it end in the zoning where the, where, where the apartments are considered to, you know? That's on Catherine, isn't it? I don't know, I'm not sure. Catherine is the next street over from, uh, is just west of uh, Gotham. Okay. If you look at your zoning map, there is a section that is zoned multiple family. Yeah, yeah. So the west so it must stop before that, right? The western side of that is the, is the line. Oh, the western side of the, okay, of that development. What two numbers did you say, Paul? 26 and 35. 26 and 35? Oh, yeah, these two. Okay, then that would be uh, Catherine's right here. Just about right here. Yes, that's what it is. So most of the things here are it's all these are zoning ordinance issues i mean it, it seems like most of this would be taken care of in a zoning ordinance issue so how would we address this as a point 
in the master plan. So if if these are all items that you would like to do, um, the master plan sets up the policy to enact these things. So you would include language that points to these, and then as we're doing with all the other chapters in the ordinance, you have kind of the Here's the goal and the vision of the township. Here are the details that discuss that. Here are some of the tools. And then the last part is these are the strategies we want to use. And so then once you've adopted that, then you go and take a the step to change the zoning ordinance to, to add these kind of tools. So then it would be a lot more discussion down the road. At the time when we would discuss yes. them to propose yeah. changes to the zoning ordinance. Yeah, and I, I think the idea of tonight's discussion was just to get the understanding of what the direction is and what kinds of things you'd like to see happen. So uh, that gives me some direction of what kinds of things to include in that policy discussion so that then the next step would be to go into the fine details of, you know, dotting the I's and crossing the T's in the ordinance. And there will be plenty of discussion about that, I'm sure, at the time. You've got a pretty good read on. I think so. I think it was a good discussion tonight. I appreciate yeah. everybody. It seems very popular. Okay, anyone else? Any last minute thoughts? Anything else? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I, I mentioned it. Um, just the um, transfer development rights. For any of us that don't know, you just two minutes on that or a minute. Sure. So, transfer development rights would essentially, um, you would play in a target area where we would accept density, we would accept higher, higher development, um, and we would delineate areas where uh, we might be looking for more preservation. So a developer could come in and say, okay, I own both of these pieces of land. I'm gonna perpetually protect, pr protect this piece of land from growth and development, and I'm gonna take the, I'm gonna get a density bonus, basically, in, in the USD, for instance. And so again, that would be a tool, like TJ said, that we would have to look at the specific numbers or ratio that we would. That, that would require management and writing something around the whole process. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. You have to actually correct, accept it and write in whatever an ordinance to repeal it. In the zoning ordinance, you could create a separate oh, ordinance for it. But it's not, it's not something we have access to now. It has to be built correct. and managed. Yep. Linda, I'd like to correct that. What I at least misunderstood about transfer development rights, you do not have to have a receiving and a sending zone. You can simply allow transfer development rights. So you take any large parcel on your map, and a developer comes in and they want the greater density instead of two acre minimums, they want one acre minimums. The lands will support the one acre minimums, is the assumption. They go out to another private property owner. And they cut a deal with the private property owner. Doesn't involve the township. Doesn't involve the township's money. The township would look as they're reviewing the plan. They would make sure that the appropriate agreement is there, that the piece that's basically the private property owner selling the development rights, that they have that restriction. They're going to have, have a restriction on their deed, so in, in perpetuity, it stays undeveloped. But you do not have to have a sending zone. You do not have to have a receiving zone. All you have to have is a tool in your ordinance that allows it to take place. And it can be done between private property owners. Just like right now, a pro private property owner can submit to the green belt and say, buy my development rights. It's the same thing. You're giving that property owner another place to sell those same development rights. You know, so it, it can be much simpler. <coughs> and, uh, yeah, it, I was glad Bruce brought up transfer development rights. Um, most of you know I, years ago, raised children. Won't get into whether I did a good job or a bad job. But I will tell you that when I offered my children an incentive versus uh, here are the rules, they did a lot better. And so I think that when Bruce brought up the transfer development rights, that's an incentive for two property owners to work together to have an area perpetually kept undeveloped. It's not necessarily open space. It might be farm, so they could have it to woods, but it's going to stay undeveloped. I think that this township would be much more comfortable working towards incentives 
than being restrictive. And I was I was glad that that seemed to be the direction that you guys were going tonight. Thank you again. Mr. Horton, did you have something to add? Okay. All right. Good discussion, folks. Okay. Reports of commissioners. Reports of commissioners and correspondence. Board of Trustees. Uh, the board approved the rezoning application from the office commercial to AM. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. CDA? None? Nothing. Land preservation? Okay, we did not have our meetings well last month, and our meeting is tomorrow night. So nothing really new other than um, based on our conversation tonight, I'm sure we would enjoy anybody participating on land preservation. If this kind of conversation interests you, it dovetails with what we're talking about here. So the more that participate, the better the community will enjoy it. Um, I like to have these kind of discussions where it would it would be nice if we had more people to contribute or more ideas. But I like when we can all just kind of have an organized discussion and thoughts and ideas. And I think Bruce put it best that you know we do throw a lot of things out there on the wall. Or not, you know sometimes you just need to hear it out loud. And I know many times I'll say something out loud and I'll think, oh she does that. <laughs> but you know, it, it's and sometimes it spurs on other things. So I, I like Bill to have these discussions. Plus, I think it also um, helps Paul have a better. I mean, he's been with us for a while. It helps have a better understanding of, of the direction and expectations and some of these things come up because things are moving. Okay, zoning administrator. All right. So got a list of activity. Activity seemed to be up this month. We. Uh, had three new builds, new home builds, and one demolition, so that's a net increase of three. I mean two. Uh, five decks were built, two pools, uh, three accessory buildings, one remodel, a couple of re-roofs, and uh, AT&T put some new wires on a tower. <laughs> and I too appreciate the discussion. Thank you all for your Motion to approve the minutes of June 18, 2018. Second. Second. All those in favor of approving the minutes of June 18, 2018 as submitted say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Public comment? Linda? I'd just like to thank you guys for allowing the, the public to participate. And I do have one question is that I've been coming to a lot of meetings. You guys have been updating the master plan for quite a while. Is there a target date by which this will be done in as much as the state requires it to be reviewed every five years? It's not take five years to do it. <laughs> what, if you guys had a it's target a, it's date. It's a living document. <laughs> <laughs> Understood, Bart, but yeah. as somebody who is concerned about land use decisions, it, it's a little disconcerting that it seems to drag on and, and I've lost wherever that target date is if you guys can work on. Thank you. We're close. Just that something new came up and I thought it was important with the density thing so we threw it in there and then we didn't have a meeting last month so it was dragging out a little bit but no we're, we're anxious to get it done as well. And I also want to correct when I opened the meeting I said of June 18, 2018 I was obviously looking at <laughs> so I stated the wrong date of our actual meeting here, which is August 20th, 2018. So um, that being said, meeting adjourned. Oh, what? Oh, sure. Linda, is tomorrow the uh, groundbreaking ceremony? Yes, it is. Groundbreaking ceremony at the library tomorrow for the expansion. I think it's at 6 o'clock. Oh. Very good. Well, the August 20th, 2018 Planning Commission meeting is 
adjourned at 8.45. Thank you.